So my name is Yehoshua Corin. Um, you can, I do use Twitter at Analytics Ninja, and today I'm going to be talking about strategy and techniques. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of hands-on. That's kind of how I like to do my presentations. Um, but before I talk about like how to do things, I want to talk about the importance of doing things. Right? Before collecting data, we always need to have strategy. Okay, so. Let's start with something. I, I couldn't think of anything more fun than a definition. Right? So, Pep, can you read this definition of, you know, what is web analytics? I can. Thank you. Go for it. Web analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, and, and reporting of internet data for purposes of understanding and optimizing web usage. I couldn't have done that better myself. Thank you, Pep. Yay. So, that's what we're doing. And so much of what we heard about um, so far um, at this conference, a lot of it fits underneath this umbrella. All the user research, right? that's a part of analytics as well. Okay? What we're going to be talking about today is quantitative data, not qualitative data. And I will address them both in my talk, but it's important to keep in mind what your web analytics quantitative data does not do and what it does do. So I'm going to spend my time showing you what we can do with it. Um, I love this. I put this meme together because this is the question that I hate the most from, from clients or from people who want to like, learn about analytics. They say, well, I've been using Google Analytics since 2007, and I have years and years and years of data, and what is it telling me? Right? Have you, people ever think, like, what am I supposed to do with all this data? Right? That's wrong. That's wrong. Your data isn't supposed to be telling you things. You have to ask it questions. It's supposed to be answering questions. So the whole purpose of data collection is in order to gain insights so that we can inform our decisions. Okay? And in order to do that, we have to have questions. So that process, this is a, a framework created by my friend Caleb Whitmore. Uh, it starts with goals basic business goals and the supporting questions. So usually people jump to that later stuff. They're like, okay, where are the reports? What, what am I doing on my implementation? But what they'll end up seeing is when I start asking a question of my web analytics data, I'm not finding the answers because I didn't think about it in advance. So planning is critical. And I highly recommend watching this YouTube video with my friend Daniel Weisberg, who works on the Google Analytics team, where he talks about two approaches towards segmentation. One he calls it mission-driven, and one he calls ad hoc. Right? Mission-driven segmentation are the things that you're going to be thinking about in advance, whereas ad hoc segmentation are things that are going to be within your tool right now. For example, device category. Is it mobile or are they on a desktop? Uh, region. Is a person in uh, Denmark or are they in Germany? Okay, so those are things that you can do your ad hoc segmentation. That's very important to be able to do. But the mission driven segmentation put on top of it is where, as a process of thinking about how am I going to answer my questions, will lay the foundations for you being able to get meaningful, usable data. Okay? Well, let's start with a little bit of basics and then we're going to go, okay? Dimensions and metrics. Those are the building blocks. But just FYI, I'm speaking pretty much in terms of um, Google Analytics as a tool for an example, simply because it's the most widely used uh, quantitative analytics package. But these are principles that you can take to, uh, to your web trends, to your Adobe Analytics, to your KISS metrics. Okay, so framework. The dimensions and metrics. Dimensions describe your data. Metrics are your data. Dimensions are your rows, and metrics are your columns. Okay, sounds simple, but we're going to see something fun in a minute. Okay? Before we take that to the next level, let's talk about how to build good reports. Right? Any sort of report that I build in Google Analytics is going to really be a custom report. Right? That allows you to drill down and uncover insights. All those custom reports fit a framework of having metrics that tell me about acquisition, behavior, and conversions, your desired outcomes. So some acquisition metrics like visits, costs, it's analytics reporting and analysis is like cooking, right? It's not baking. Baking, you have to know, I need a, a quarter cup of salt. And if you put that in your cookies, you're gonna screw it up, right? Um, 
But with analytics, it's like I'm going to add some of these metrics. I'm going to choose the types of dimensions I'm going to drill down to. Okay, I'm going to spice it up with some micro conversions. Right, the indications of people taking action that add value, economic value, to the to your website and to their experience um, that we can track. Okay, so that becomes the framework for your reporting. And I think that in all of your reporting, you should be able to understand some sort of flow. That's why the ABCs are important, the acquisition, behavioral metrics, and then conversion metrics, especially when it comes to things that are indicative of outcomes. I like to have these horizontal funnels for each step of, a, of something that a user can do that's going to be important. Track that as a goal. You'll be able to line that up in your reports, and you can then segment you know, across, say, all your campaigns. Okay. Um, now, remember I was mentioning a little bit about dimensions and metrics? I'm going to show you something that, um, that I kind of came across this year that, that I found exciting with regards to event tracking. Right? Event tracking, you see here, I'm tracking a lot of things that are happening on a, on a product page. They view the product, selected a color, this is, this is retail, they added it their basket to their wish list. Okay? I can drill down into that. Right? I'm looking at my add to baskets and I'm looking at it by channel. I can even pivot that in Google Analytics so I can look at all my channels across all my actions. But the metric here is events. From a reporting perspective, you're telling how many times was, did somebody suck the cider add to basket for CPC and organic, but the metric itself in Google Analytics is an event. What's the difference? Right? If you use a custom metric, you now have a number that you can use to calculate. Okay? So all of a sudden, I've pivoted, not my dimensions, I've pivoted my metrics, add to baskets, wish list, and I can look across those metrics at every single dimension. Okay? Pretty easy to implement for, it's just an increment. Metric is counts things. So I'm just going to fire that metric of one any time that I want to track this CTA. Here's up. I want it, this, this site, they um, do PowerPoint slides. And you can download a PowerPoint slide, so I want to track that. OK, boom. Now I have a metric of download button clicked by all my different categories and subcategories. But because it's a metric, I can use a calculated metric. I can do math, right? Amazing, in the analytics, you would want to do math, right? All of a sudden, I'm dividing the download buttons by the page views per category, and I get a very, a much more useful metric that's going to help inform my decisions, such as downloads per page view, and I can compare them across my different categorizations. So, right, what do we do with that? Well, I could see that that's, people are trying to download these things more, I can make more prominent placement, I can focus my keywords, uh, bidding or my, or my organic search focus on certain keyword blocks. I can test things on my pages because based upon what I see in terms of intent, right? Um, those are just some examples, right? But however you approach it, I love this here. This is from Tim Wilson, right? Um, it, he calls it avoiding data wandering. So before you start looking into your data to get reports and analysis and I would also say before you even start and all of your data collection, this is the same thing. I believe something, right? And if I am right, we will something, right? In um, more sophisticated parlance, we call that a hypothesis, right? Um, from Tim's perspective, he always stresses don't call this a hypothesis when you're speaking with people in, in, the, in the business world. Right? If you're speaking with your, with your CMO, well, I think that my hypothesis is something boring that you're going to sleep through, blah, 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 blah. Right? That's not going to work. Right? But if you talk just about people speaking in simple human language, well, do you believe that? And why are we even looking into this? What question are we answering? Right? That's going to save you time in your analysis, which is the whole point of the data collection, and the earlier stages. P parenthetical note. Okay? Um, whoever uses a metric called like conversion rate, e-commerce conversion rate in Google Analytics. Conversion rate? Nobody uses conversion rate at this conference? Pep, what's, what's up? <laughs> OK. Um, oh, another definition, denominator. Right? The thing about conversion rate in GA is that the denominator is wrong. Why? Because in most cases, it's really based upon sessions. With your calculated metrics, as long as you have the metrics coming in, right, you can track something like transactions per users. 
right? And people send questions, well, it's not really users, and that's true, but it's sure of a hell of a lot better than sessions. So using calculated metrics, you can actually improve the entire system of Google Analytics by looking at user-based metrics instead of session-based metrics. Okay, moving forward. Being clear about like, what are we trying to achieve here in terms of, in terms of digital measurement, okay? Um, here's a website that I like a lot, right? Um, now, this guy is going like this because, oh no, my page category is uncategorized, so I'm not able to track like, what is this content really about? Right? And for content sites, there's a lot of things. Chris was mentioning your data later. We're going to kind of talk about that, how to describe your site, because your description of the site will lead you to better understanding. Remember? Understanding and optimizing as, a, as what we're trying to do in analytics. Okay? For content sites, and especially for growing SEO, I love this post from Lunametrics, where they say, we can track our content by, does it have images in it? How long is it? When is the best time to publish? Okay? Um, but the objectives of what publishers want is oftentimes over time. So again, the session-based metrics aren't going to work as much. You need to use this sort of report in Google Analytics looking at cumulative pages per user or cohort analysis, trying to see what are the things that are, when you're applying segments to this cohort, that are causing more people to come back again and again later. Right? That's because a lot of us users um, of Google Analytics are just going to get stuck in the mud of session-based. When not really thinking about the fact that the user experience is, is outside of that box. And that's a little bit of a problem with the tool because it was built when the session made more sense. Now there are good reports, such as multi-channel funnels, which help you an an analyze your multi-touch visits and user-based segments, which will give you more insights in terms of the behavior as it relate to the final outcomes. Okay? And that will lead, for example, for uh, content sites to money. Okay? Something else to consider doing in terms of understanding um, your site. You might say, well, what are my goals? Right? I can't, this, what does this site do? This site reviews restaurants. Okay? Um, their goal, actually they have a number of different goals, but their main goal is to have people find the restaurant that they're looking for. And one of the ways that they do that is um, they're trying to figure out how to do it by session scoring. So if you view a menu, you, you get a two. If you email this to a friend, you get a six. If you add it to your calendar, that's an eight. If you order online or make a reservation, you met your goal, that's a 10. And by using that session scoring, each one of those interactions becomes a goal value. It can create an ability to compare your different channels or to compare your different, um, any dimension, really any dimension, because you've scored it on that session-based level. Now, what's important about this is that this can work for any site, because any site really has goals and micro goals, okay? Moving on. Let's start a chant. Should we join an analytics chant? Segment, segment. Who's from the Netherlands? Segment. Segment. <laughs> All right. Um, so this man, I think, is, I should put, if I was one of your other guys who were doing these presentations, I'd put a crown on him. I'm going to drop down and be that crown because I think he's like the king of digital analytics. His name is Gary Angel. Um, he wrote a new book, and his blog is highly, highly um, recommended, Measuring the Digital World. Okay? He talks about two types of segmentation. One is your traditional visitor or persona-based segmentation. This is who you are, okay? In relationship to your unit of work, which means your behavioral, what it is that you're doing. Okay, so two levels of being able to, to segment. Um, let's give a couple examples. For an e-commerce store, um, we might want to segment by the type of customers. Is it your first purchase? Are you returning? Well, something that, to notice here, look at the, how the um, cart to detail rate is much lower for those users who are coming back to your site. They're spending more time viewing more products before they can make that additional decision to buy from you again. Interesting, where do we go with that, okay? Um, the, these are all custom dimensions, user-based custom dimensions. They're database-driven to tell us about the user. Um, and then we can apply that to something like merchandise. Here's merchandise by you know, your spring versus your holiday seasonality. Or a B2B example, right? This was of a company that I worked with. They manufactured linear actuators. And I was like, hmm, you mean screws? And they're like, no, it's not a screw. It's a linear actuator, which I was like, okay. 
if you, that's what you do for a living. You like make <laughs> big, long screws. But they're very important because these are the things that make airplanes not fall out of the sky, right? Which is like very, if you're, if you're looking at this form, they're, they're getting lead information. What industry are you in? When do you anticipate purchasing? That's a really important piece of information. You can, once you collect that piece of information, it's in your analytics, you can segment by it and you can remarket re to them as we're going to, Chris mentioned, and we're going to go there pretty much here. So that structure of your website really does tell that story. Here's an example of a company, they do training, online training and in-person training for Microsoft or Cisco or, or web development, or project management, technical training, okay? So they didn't have visibility into, well, which sorts of courses are people um, looking at in relationship to are they registering for our courses? So by adding a little data layer, where they were able to see, oh, yeah, we can see how many people go from a course page to registration form to completing the registration by the technology, okay? And what we ended up seeing was like that web development project, uh, web development and project management courses had a much higher abandonment rate simply because we knew that we wanted to answer questions about why is that course technology important. It told the story of their business, okay? Next step. Um, Intent, right? This is piggybacking off of what I was talking about earlier. So there's this dude. I did a search on the internet and I found a picture of him, right? He loves hoodies, right? Totally loves hoodies. So what does he do? He adds a hoodie to his cart. Or he's looking for swimwear and he adds swimwear to his wish list, right? Not so fancy. But did you notice what type of segment this is? A sequence segment, right? Why is this important? Because something called hit level segmentation. Hit level segmentation is how you can, um, is only possible when you're using sequence segments. So let me explain what that means. Um, you wanted to have two pieces of information. You wanted to know that the person added to a cart, and you wanted to know what they added to the cart. Those are two different pieces of information. If you created a conditional segment, say, show me add to carts, and it, there was a, a hoodie. Right? That will return all sessions where people saw a hoodie and all sessions where somebody added to cart. That's not what you wanted to look for. Right? Hit level segmentation allows you to see those criteria together, people who added hoodies to their cart. Or has anybody with Optimizely or, or VWO fired an event for a, a, um, an experiment name and variation? Right? Oh. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So if you want to actually know, did a person see a particular experiment and variation, you need to use hit level segmentation. Otherwise, you're going to say, show me all people who saw this experiment, and show me all people who saw control. Well, control is across many experiments. Okay? So hit level segmentation is, did the person see this experiment? Very important. Okay, back to our example of these folks who do PowerPoint presentations. Um, we want to track this CTA, right? So we're going to use a custom metric, and what happens actually when you click it, this is, they get to here and say, oh, paywall, right? Which actually kind of works for them because the person really wants to download that presentation because I'm getting up on stage here tomorrow and I need this right now. I, um, I'm going to maybe go through that. But what, check out this segment. We were looking at was the product, when I click that download, sometimes it downloads, sometimes it doesn't. Well, was it paid or free product? Um, did they click that a paid product? Yes. And were they a current subscriber? No, because if they're a current subscriber and they click that download button, it would have downloaded as well. Okay? And what does that turn into? The number of people who tried to download the slide. Right? My segment, they tried to download the slide, and they're not my customer already. So I have visitor or persona. I, they, I know these are not my customers. And I know their intention. They tried to download a, site, a slide that included a timeline or a puzzle or strategy. Okay? Um, here's an example of a company, again, that does uh, training. They, they actually sell a lot of DVDs still. Right? They were recently purchased by O'Reilly. Um, what do we know about intent? the user's intent on this page. Well, they can start doing things like looking at their purchase options, right? By having a data layer, we can also um, infer some other things about their intent. They're interested in the Adobe stack. They are a beginner, 
Okay? Why is that important? Because we can already see how am I supposed to be able to, how can I start changing my, either my messaging, my testing, my remarketing. Um, Google Analytics is not just a, a data collection and reporting tool. It's not just an analysis tool. It's also a performance marketing tool because you're able to add those remarketing lists directly to, um, to AdWords okay, and, and the Google Display Network. The, the other thing is once you just have this all in structured data, you, like, like Chris was mentioning, you can just create all of your, your remarketing lists on Facebook and any, any sort of pixel that you want. Okay? So step five is going to be some practical how do you use some of this data, particularly from a marketing perspective. I give you some sort of techniques for how to approach it from an analysis perspective, how to create good segments. And here's going to be from a, um, from a use perspective. So this was one of my favorite blog posts I read this year. It's this dude here. His name's Mike Rhodes. Um, I highly recommend it. It's a pretty massive post about the remarketing grid. Um, and since I read this, I was like, OK, I'm going to just talk about it as well and give him full credit because this is not my idea. I really like what he's doing here. And keep in mind my previous presentation about segmentation and building lists for what we're going to do here. So check this out. This is your typical remarketing list. Everybody, you visit the site, and I see your ad on the next web page that I go to most of the time, right? Um, but he's saying, really, we're interested in not people who are somehow not interested, or the people who have already converted. They're already my, my customers. We don't want to show them our ads again and again, right? You, you already bought your ticket here. You don't need to be told about it again and again, right? So we want to target your interested folks. But how do we know who's interested? Okay, hmm, tough question. Craig, a big brain. How do we know if somebody's interested? Um, the, the content signal is going to be the number of signals that will be sent to you can define the same way as indicating that there's going to be a shipping order of um, interest. Okay, there are signals that we can pay attention to to listen and to, are, they, are they interested in the product? Um, that is true. But that's my second point, because the real way is to ask them. They may just like be doing the signals, and it could just actually be some kid. We don't really know what's going on on the site when somebody's hitting that add to cart, right? So Craig's not wrong, because that's my next point, because there are quantitative data can make us make inferences into their intent. But as we heard so much yesterday, that user, user studies are really important to understand how people are using the site, but we don't really know somebody's intent in, until we ask them. So it's a balance. So do we really know why you're doing something? No, not until I ask you. Are we stuck without that? Not at all. We have all this information of data that we can collect that is, it looks like they're interested. Well, they click that download now button at a different rate for across a large sample, right? Let's look at some examples. We talked about these earlier, our micro conversions, right? Your add to carts, your add to wish lists, your viewing videos, forms, comparing items, blah, 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 right? These are the, th actions that people are taking that are indicative of some level of intent. When I say discover your own, what do I mean? Discover your own means take, your, take a segment of your converters, okay? And then look at all of your event tracking. What are your converters doing? Take any of these micro-conversions, people who add the cart but don't convert. What are, what are they doing? What is indicative of intent at different levels, okay? Uh, Mike says then take that, now that we're looking at that interested folks, and break it into time cohorts, okay? Now, these are three, zero to three days, four to seven, one week, the second half of the month, right? So you're going to take each one of these time frames and create a, a list. Everybody comes to your site, and you're going to say, this list is for three days, for seven days, for 14 days. And then you add them when you're creating your actual list, when you're, when you're combining, you add them as negatives, and you add them as excludes. And you can change it in a such a way that you're having time decay, decreasing bid modifiers. Because if someone will become less interested over time, or you can use it to fight banner fatigue. Okay? So just by simply playing around with the, the length of the um, audience list creation, how long is that person in that particular cookie? All of a sudden, you have all this power in your hands as a marketer to take everything that we've spoken about in terms of understanding what are the key things that people are doing, who they are, 
right, visitor or persona, and their intent, which is, in my opinion, more important, like kind of those, those signals that Craig just mentioned, okay? Um, and we can, we can turn it into a powerful marketing tool. So that's my family, um, uh, all, all seven of us, okay? And the little guy right there, right, um, when he took this picture, he was four months old. He's a little bit bigger, but I haven't found a better picture. So, um, so what happens for, for kids, Right? How would I remarket them? Okay, let's say I go to Jimbery, this kid's clothing store, and I start clicking around. I'm tracking my clicks. I always say, yeah, he's three to six months old. Okay? So let's say I actually go through and buy something. I actually don't need to. I just need to be browsing, even to a certain degree, or added to my cart. What do we know if I did buy something? The age of the child, gender of the child, type of product purchased, and how silly I'm willing to make him look by putting him in all this panda crap, right? Um, of all of those four examples, which one is wrong? Age, gender, type of product, how silly? Any of these wrong? No, they're all right? Actually, the last one is wrong. Because you don't know if it's me, or if you don't know if it's my mom <laughs> who's willing to put him into all of that clothes. So the who is less important than, than, the, than the buyer, right? You, have a, you had, a, you had a, a customer, and they don't care what the kid looks like in the panda stuff. OK, so how would you retarget? For, for next. Two months, show me that age-appropriate stuff, because he's three to six months, so sell the kid clothes that fits him. And between three and six months, guess what happens? Raise your hand if you have kids. Anybody have kids? Anybody know that kids' feet grow pretty fast, right? So just sell me more shoes, right? And then, you know, he's just going to outgrow that stuff again, and then have to buy more clothing. And then after 12 months, you can sell my personal information to a predatory loan shark, because I'm just going to be broke. So let us recap. Um, Planning your data collection, right? That planning is, the foundation is strategy. Make sure you document it well. It's mission-driven. What are the questions you want to answer? Because if you don't ask the question before you start collecting the data, you're going to ask the question after you start collecting the data, and you're not going to have the answer, and you'll be kind of screwed, right? When you're building reports, always acquisition, behavior, and outcomes, those conversions, right? Build those into horizontal funnels. Build those into the steps that people will be taking towards your desired actions. Um, we mentioned Gary Angel's two types of segmentation about the person and about their intent, right? What it is that they're doing, those signals. Um, and remember, in order to uncover intent in, let's say, Google Analytics, you need to use hit level segmentation. That will tell you, oh, they did this with that, right? You have to be able to put those together. Um, retargeting those interested people, according to Mike Rhodes, um, can be done with time bid, um, the time decay bid modifiers. Okay, it's finding those interested people, making sure you don't have banner fatigue. Okay, excellent. Second, oh, and of course, I'm just gonna let this one roll. Do we do we get a chant before? Segment, 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 segment. Oh, good, thank you. Segment. All right. Any questions?